The other thing I've loved about resistance training is I find that it's taught me a lot of resilience. Is There's the whole idea of, I don't think I can lift this, and then I lift it, and then I lift more. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is you know amazing. And there's that self-efficacy. And But I find that that's leaked into other parts of my life where I have this sense of resilience in other areas. And I really believe that strength training really helps me with that from you know a mental health perspective. Welcome to the Eat, Live and Move podcast by Miyagi, a space where we bring you the latest science-backed conversations, expert insights and practical tips relating to all things health and wellness. Hello, I am Dr. Gina Cleo, your personal habit change expert. And I'm Dr. Ross Walker, a cardiologist and preventative health expert. Together with our 60 plus years of collective experience, we're on a mission to help you improve your health and transform your habits so that you can eat, live and move better one episode at a time without the fluff or the fads. Now, before we begin, a quick reminder to hit subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to today so that you can get notified every time we drop a new episode. Today's episode, we're going to be focusing on movement and specifically taking a look at resistance training. I think a lot of people are now familiar with the concept of resistance training or strength training, but not necessarily understanding why it's so important for our health and well-being, especially as we move through the ages. So today we're going to look at the science, take a deep dive into why it's a vital component of our exercise routines We're going to explore the benefits of resistance training and, of course, as always, provide some really practical tips on how you can get more resistance training into your week. I also know there are so many misconceptions around resistance training. I speak to a lot of women who are like, I don't want to get buff. I don't want to get super muscly. And I'm like, that is actually really, really hard to achieve. So we're going to debunk some of those myths today. So let's dive right in. Ross, I'd love to start with, can you explain to us in your doctorish way, what actually is resistance training? Well, I'd prefer not to explain it in my doctorish way. I just want to, it's pretty simple, really. It's any physical activity that forces your muscles to contract against an external resistance. So to give you an example, any sort of body weight exercise, resistance band workouts, lifting weights, and you don't, as you so rightly said, Gina, you don't have to become this super buffed person who looks like you spend all day, every day in the gym. It's just simple things, um, using equipment like kettlebells, weight machines at the gym. But when you do resistance training repeatedly and consistently, your muscles become stronger. And why is that so important for our uh, muscles to become look, stronger? There are so many important reasons. I just want to run through them now. So these are some of the benefits. Firstly, it supports your general metabolism. A lot of people say to me, what is metabolism? Well, metabolism is basically how the cells of the body work. So whilst you do, when you're doing cardio exercise, that burns calorie, but resistance training continues to burn calories after the workout. And when you increase your lean muscle mass, you elevate what's called your basal metabolic rate, which is basically how efficient your metabolism is working. And this means your body's burning more calories, even at rest, which helps you in weight loss. And I, I don't want people to lose weight. I want them to lose fat and gain muscle. That's the key. So people shouldn't be so focused on the, what they're seeing on the scales. They should be focused more on their waist circumference. That's, that's the big deal. So resistance exercise, in my view, is vital when you're losing that abdominal fat, when you're reducing your waist circumference. Because if you're not doing resistance training, you can actually lose muscle mass instead of fat. And this slows your metabolic rate, meaning you can regain weight pretty easily because you're you're burning way less calories when you're at rest. So that's number one. Number two, which is my whole life, is disease prevention. And regular resistance exercise associated with a marked reduction in variety of chronic diseases, including not just cardiovascular disease and diabetes, which everyone thinks when you exercise, that's what you're stopping, but certain types of cancer and even your overall death rate. So just to to sound a little bit medically boring here, we'll go to a journal called the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And this explored the benefits of two different types of exercise on all-cause mortality. So aerobic or cardio exercise and lifting weights. 
And the study suggested that adding weightlifting, and again, I'm not talking about the, the 100 kilo bench pressing nonsense, I'm just talking about general light weights to aerobic exercise can further reduce the risk of all-cause death, not just cardiovascular disease. The study f- found that weightlifting is associated with an additional 9%. This is an absolute 9% decrease in the risk of all-cause death whilst aerobic training alone reduces about 32%. So when you hear people talking about a reduction of this, a reduction of that, you want absolute versus uh, relative. So this is pretty pretty profound stuff. And weight, weightlifting alone also reduced 15% reduction in cancer mortality as well. So according to, to experts, it's never too late to get started with weight training to receive the benefits. So even, even if you're in your 60s and you've never lifted weights, I think it's a good thing to, to get some light weights and just build them up to what you're comfortable with. You should never overdo it because you'll start to rip little fibers in your muscles and damage the muscles, but it's important to have a program. So that's number two. Number three is improved body composition. What I was suggesting before, incorporating resistance exercise into your routine can help reduce body fat and increase lean muscle mass. Exactly what you want to do. So this not only contributes to a healthy, healthier body composition, but also enhances your physical appearance. So you actually look better. Now, here's a big deal. Sarcopenia. Everyone's heard of osteoporosis. That Everyone thinks osteoporosis, weak bones. It's a pretty good definition. And osteoporosis starts, wait for this, sorry to be depressing everyone, but at age 30. Doesn't start when you're 60, starts when you're 30. People have so 25% of postmenopausal women have clinical osteoporosis, but I'm saying the process starts at age 30, but so does sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is a medical term that's used to describe the age-related loss of muscle mass, strength, and function, and again, starts age 30 and accelerates after age 50. So every decade, we lose 3 to 8% of our muscle mass from age 30, and that really accelerates, especially when the hormones start to go south at 50 and especially over the age of 60. And it can have incredible negative effects on, on your overall health and quality of life. And performing regular resistance exercise helps to combat this by firstly preserving muscle mass and countering the effects of muscle loss with aging. It also increases your muscle strength, so this stimulates muscle fibers to become much stronger and much more robust. And again, it helps with osteoporosis because think of it logically. You've got these muscles supporting your bones. So if you've got weak muscles, then that leads to weak bones as well. And an interesting study that was done a few years ago looked at the cause for loss of independence and frailty in older people. And it found that 30% came from cognitive decline. So you don't think as well, but 70% came from having weaker muscles and weaker bones. So it's really, really important to think about the effects of losing muscle mass on your bones and on your general health. It also obviously improves your posture, your balance. And if you've got pain, it helps with pain management. And all of this improves your functional capacity that I was just mentioning before and quality of life as we age. So to improve an individual's ability to to perform daily activities, maintain independence, reduce the risk of things like falls and fractures. And here's the thing, Gina, when, when you youngins fell over, you say, oh, I fell over. But when you're over 60, you had a fall. Different issue. So that's it's a different thing. So And resistance training can also have an effect on our hormones, can't it? Yeah, yeah, because we we've all heard of things like insulin resistance, which is the most the, the most common genetic abnormality in the world that sets you up for things like diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol issues, easy to get uh, weight around the belly. But when you do the resistance training, it actually improves the effects of insulin resistance on your body. But there's also effects on mental mental well being as well, and you're the expert there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know regular exercise, including resistance training, releases endorphins, and that makes us feel good. They are our feel-good hormones. So that can reduce stress, anxiety, depression. It can just make us feel really good overall. We obviously sleep way better on the days that we exercise when we have regular exercise. And I think improving our mental well-being in general gives us greater confidence. You know, I started, okay, I have a powerlifting story. Are you ready for this? I'm probably the last person you would think had a powerlifting story. But 
Several years ago, I was like getting myself into the property market and I built a house out in the hood. Like it was the Gold Coast hood. I will not mention the suburb, but I was there and there weren't very many gyms around in this area, but there was a powerlifting gym. So I was like, all right, I guess we're going to go to a powerlifting gym. The only reason I went was they had like a 30 day free trial. I was like, what's what's the harm? So I went. Now, if, if anyone's aware of powerlifting, it's based on three main movements, which is squat, deadlift, and bench press. And the people who generally powerlift, their physique is generally more stocky, shorter build, um, and like heavier set. And if you've ever seen me, I'm lanky. I've got really long, my coach used to call me LL Cool G, which is like long levers, cool G because my limbs are so long and slim. Anyway, I thought I could just do it anyway. I entered a powerlifting competition after two years of consistent powerlifting. Now, the only reason I did this, Ross, this is an insight into my personality, is because I was the only person in my weight category. Therefore, all I needed to do is stand on the podium and I would win. And that's exactly what I did. So I was under the 58 kilogram category. I had to just I think I deadlifted over twice my body weight and I was so stoked with that. But the wild part was, I remember when you said earlier about metabolism and how resistance training really boosts our metabolism, I was eating so much food. I was training four days a week, lifting, lifting quite heavy. So it's not necessarily what we're talking about here. Like it was just heavy lifting at the time. And I felt like no matter how much I ate, my body weight maintained the same. And it was it was like my superpower. I loved it. I was like, all I need to do is just keep training. But now, that was a few years ago. I don't power lift anymore because I did acquire a few injuries, as you could imagine. I now do hypertrophy training, which is lower weights, higher repetitions. Yeah, so, so hypertrophy training is really around Uh, increasing the size of the muscle, but not necessarily like focusing on the internal fibers or like the the strength of the muscle. So we still get strong, but we also look good at the same time, essentially is what hypertrophy is. My body isn't one to build muscle very easily. It doesn't look like I build muscle when I do. So hypertrophy training, the reason I chose it is it's much gentler on the body it's kinder, there's less room for injuries compared to something like really heavy lifting, which just isn't necessary, is it? No, no. I mean, like, no. a lot of people do. It's it's a bit like people that run marathons, and I say to them, there's a perfectly good bus service. I <laughs> There's there's no actual benefit from going the extra mile. The, the benefit is exactly how, how, how much training should people be doing, how much exercise should they be doing every week. Mm. Yeah, and I the the recommendations are about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or aerobic exercise, 75 minutes of vigorous exercise. But I just say to people, look, rather than looking at the minutes, just make sure you get somewhere between three to five hours of exercise that's testing you. That, in my view, should be two thirds cardio and a third resistance training, and that's that that's the way it should be. And, and can you do it all once? Well, it's a lot to do three hours exercise in one hit. I think it's best to spread it over the week, and, and and that's that's really the sensible way. The WHO, World World Health Organization, that's what they particularly say. And yeah, but I think, okay. as I said, two thirds cardio, third resistance training. That's the way to do it. Because with that, you said that it's a good idea to get a program, and I completely agree. I think if you don't know what you're doing in the gym and you don't know where to start, or even yeah. if you're at home wanting to do some resistance training, it's all about form. It took me two years to get really good at deadlifting because it is such a complex like it's such a complex movement and I think we take for granted all the the little things that we can do with our body that can ruin our tendons and you know pull muscles and do all sorts of things like that but Ross a lot of the time when I've seen resistance training programs they are generally like four days five days a week so that doesn't really fit in with the advice that you've just mentioned Hmm. Yeah, but what I, what I'm saying is you don't need to go to a gym to do resistance training. You could you can purchase some pretty inexpensive weights and do the stuff at home if you want to. Some people enjoy 
the environment of a gym. Some people don't. So I think you've got to do what suits for you. People often say to me, mm. what is the best form of exercise generally? And I say it's not walking, it's not swimming, it's not cycling. The best form of exercise is one you'll keep doing. Because if you hate yeah. going to the gym, yeah, you don't go to the gym. Happen. If you don't like swimming, you're not going to swim. You yeah. got to find something that suits your uh, lifestyle and, and, and fits into your routines. Yeah. You know what? I, I absolutely love resistance training for a couple of reasons. I find that because I have to focus so much on my form so that I don't injure myself again, it's one of the only places where I'm really present. It's almost a very meditative experience because I have to really, I have to be here and only here. So I really love that sort of mind body connection that I get. The other thing I've loved about resistance training is I find that it's taught me a lot of resilience is there's the whole idea of, I don't think I can lift this. And then I lift it and then I lift more. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is you know amazing. And there's that self-efficacy and but I find that that's leaked into other parts of my life where I have this sense of resilience in other areas. And I really believe that strength training really helps me with that from you know a mental health perspective. I don't disagree with you, but there are a lot of people who may be listening at the moment who just don't do any exercise at all. And they're thinking, oh, maybe I should start this. And I think, uh, especially if you're, if you're certainly over the age of 50 and you want to start doing exercise because you've never really done it, you must go to your doctor and have a checkup. I just want to tell you one story. And this is, a, this is one of those Twilight Zone stories of a um, patient of mine who, was, who wanted to walk the Kokoda Trail at age 65. And his daughter had a dream that he died in the Kokoda Trail. So she insisted he come in to have a stress echo with me before he went on the Kokoda Trail. This is a man who was pretty fit, exercised, no symptoms at all, came in, his heart was normal at rest on the ultrasound, the ECG was all normal all the way through exercise, but at the end of exercise, the front wall of his heart stopped uh, on the ultrasound. And I said, no symptoms, none at all, no pain, no shortness of breath. And I said, let's forget about the Kokoda Trail, put him into the local hospital, severe triple vessel coronary disease, he would have died in the Kokoda Trail. So the really important point we need to make here If anyone's listening to this and wants to start exercising, you must go to your doctor first and have a full checkup. And I think it's a good thing anyhow, certain milestones in your life, maybe age 50, age 60, go and have a checkup with your doctor. If there's any slight hint of issues, now again, I'm a cardiologist, so I'm going to say this, get a referral to a cardiologist and have an assessment because it just may save your life. Yeah. Oh. Solid advice. That is so good to know. Thanks, Ross. So, so Gina, I, I, on, on this, I want to know some tips from you as the, the habit expert, what you'd suggest for people if they're wanting to start doing more resistance exercise and want to make it a habit after they've, of course, have had the medical <laughs> checkup. Of course, after the checkup. I think something with resistance training is if we don't feel confident in what we're doing, we're not going to do it. So I think, firstly, Find somewhere where you can get some educational guidance on how to actually do resistance training. That could be one session with a personal trainer. It could be jumping on YouTube and having a look at some videos on there or getting on an app, for example. Or I know that some gyms will run classes that do include resistance training. So do that as a starting point. And then you said it before us, do what you love. You have to find something that you enjoy doing. If you don't like it, you are not going to be consistent with it. It's going to feel like death every time you have to get up and do this resistance training. Resistance training can look like a whole range of things. It can look like, you know, using bands at home. It can be lifting heavy weights at a gym. It could be just using kettlebells in your lounge room. It doesn't matter what it is. You've just got to find what you like. I always find that if I've got a really great song playlist, I am pumped to go to the gym and like dance to all my music with my weights. <laughs> so that's also a really good one. And then of course, make sure that you're like you're warming up, you're setting really clear goals for yourself, know exactly what you want. Like is it you're going to start with one day a week, for example, and then you might increase that to two days later down the track. You could bring a friend with you. Accountability is always a really good idea and start really slow. Do not, don't do what I did and just go straight into really heavy because that's how you injure yourself. Start low, put your ego to the side. You know, if you have to lift those one kilogram dumbbells to start off with, 
do that and then increase progressively. It's all about progressive overload. It's also getting that routine, isn't it? That's important. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. The routine is so important. So if you're going to do it one day a week, for example, pick a day. So it might be Mondays are resistance trading days. And so you do it every Monday. At, or, you know, it could be at a certain time of day or whatever it is. So you just want to create a pattern and a routine with it when you're starting and make sure you get rest and recovery, at least 48 hours rest between working out the same muscle is really important so that you're not creating further damage to your muscles. Right. And, and also not to, to do the same thing in the same way all the time. You're only then developing one certain set of muscles. That's very true. Yeah, it's important to mix it up, do different body parts, different muscle groups, do different kinds of exercise. And when I was in Amsterdam last week, I did this Pilates class. It was Reformer Pilates, but it was called Megaforma. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but that was some serious resistance. It was like, it was this, this Megaforma thing is developed by a, some physiotherapist, but essentially there's a really high resistance in these movements. Now, I'm someone who does regular strength training, so I didn't think I would get sore at all doing mega Pilates. No, no, I couldn't walk for like two days. It was I was so sore, and it's because I was working muscles. I don't routinely work in my own workouts. It was like inner thighs and like parts of my glute that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> so it's a really good idea to, to mix it up, which I think is why having some sort of program is really valuable because programs generally will give you a nice mix of training. And then finally, with all habits, any kind of routine that you want to establish, track your progress. Keep some sort of workout journal or record, have a habit tracker so that you can tick off every time you've done a workout. You can also know then, well, how much did I lift last week? And I wonder if I can up that a tiny bit this week or not. So it's really good to track as well. And you mentioned that you were in Amsterdam last week. I just want to ask you a question. Do you know why all the famous painters were Dutch? Because you've told me this one. You've told me this yeah, one. Come on. Because they're from Holland. Exactly. Because they were born in Holland. Yes. Very good. Yes, I remembered very it. Good, very good. Do you know, I was actually standing outside the Van Gogh Museum thinking of that joke and rolling my eyes thinking, oh my goodness. Uh, that's fair. Ross. <laughs> Now, Ross, we've got a member question of the week, as we do, as this is how we wrap up our podcast episode. So our question for the day comes from James, who said, what is your stance on protein powders? Should I be using them to help me maintain my muscle mass while I'm losing weight? Yeah. What do you reckon, Ross? Well, uh, look, protein is vital. It's a, a very important, what we call macronutrient. So you've got fat sugar and protein or fat carbohydrate and protein are macronutrients and protein is one of those important things and protein's basically the way the body works if we, we didn't have proteins but there'd be no body so it allows our organs to function properly it supports our immune system help helps with appetite maintaining ad growth and muscle mass as we've just been talking about but the best way to maintain your muscle mass is resistance training not to use protein powder and a lot of people want that shortcut and i, I see that it's thinking that you can use protein powders to build your muscle without the resistance training is not the way to do it. But look, on the on a positive side, they are extracted from, in some cases, animal, but also plant-based sources. So you've got to see what the quality of the protein powder you're going for and seeing what's actually in the protein powder, because sometimes there's a fair bit of these uh, sweeteners that can be artificial sweeteners and sugars in them that may be not so good for you as well. So look, I think I think it's it's okay to do it, but it certainly shouldn't be the central part of what you're doing. And still look for the best forms of uh, a protein come from food sources, and we we know all about that. Yeah, I I source a protein. You're gonna laugh at this. The the protein powder that I use, they use um, pasture fed cows, and they're like free range in the hills of New Zealand. Oh, yes. <laughs> So I know that they're really, really well looked after. There's absolutely got no additives in it. But, you know, it's a lot more expensive than the other stuff that we get on the shelves. For me, that's a worthwhile investment, and I'll do that. I personally love protein powder 
in the morning for breakfast. I find that although I can get protein from things like eggs and dairy and beans and legumes, etc., it just isn't quite enough from for how much I need per meal. So I find that having a scoop of protein powder does help me personally just like throw it in, then I don't have to worry about that meal. But in terms of my other meals, like, you know, dinner, lunch and dinner and all my snacks, I I don't feel like I have to have protein powder. The recommendation with protein is to have 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram of your body weight. So say you're around 80 kilograms and you'd be having 64 to 80 grams of pure protein a day. But that's also got to be spread out throughout the day. You can't have it all in one meal because your body can't absorb that much protein in that one meal. Now, Ross, you did say that some people try to take a shortcut and just eat protein and you sort of not do the resistance training, but they have to go hand in hand. Don't Like you can't do resistance training and not eat protein and try to build muscle. Is that correct? No, of course. You, you've, you've got to do the work. People just want the to put in the hard yards. And I, interestingly, this is not nothing to do with the resistance training, just a funny story. About 10 years ago, I was on the Catalyst program with a colleague of mine called Dr. Tim Carr talking about the benefits of meditation. And uh, they always have to have a an antagonist. So they, we were the protagonists. They have to have an antagonist to, to give the counter-argument against meditation. And this guy said, why, why, why would you spend a half an hour meditating when you can swallow a blood pressure pill in five seconds? <laughs> and so I think it's the same argument here. We are taking prote- protein powder without putting in the hard yards. You get yeah. the benefit from putting in the effort. Yeah, oh, but we love a shortcut, Ross. We love a good pill to fix all the things. <laughs> you know what, though? When you were giving the list before of all the benefits of resistance training, I literally had thought, like, imagine if we could put all of these benefits into one capsule. We would be the richest people in the world because it impacts every single part of our body from our internal organs to our mind to our longevity, like like every part of our life is impacted by increasing muscle mass and doing resistance training. And I really don't think that especially women are doing enough resistance training. And I want to debunk the myth. I've been doing resistance training for years. And look at my arms. If you can see this, if you're watching this, I've got nothing. I have no muscle on me that you can visibly see. I'm not getting buff because you know what? I don't take steroids. That's why I won't get buff. Mm. So I want to break that myth down. The other thing I want to mention about protein powder, just to wrap up that question, and I think it's important to note that in a lot of countries, protein powder is not regulated. So, you know, whatever they've got in, whatever powders they've got in there, they're not actually regulated by any sort of food body. So that's why I think investing in a really good quality protein powder company or protein powder, it's probably a good idea if it's going to be a regular part of your diet. Yep. Good cool. points. Great points. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode on Eat, Live and Move with Miyagi, talking about all things resistance training and moving through the ages. Whatever platform you're listening to today, please hit subscribe so you don't miss out when we drop a new episode. And that's all from us. Thanks again. And we'll see you all next week for more conversations with me, Dr. Gina Cleo, and my co-host, Dr. Ross Walker. Bye. Bye.